Starship Block 2 is facing its share of challenges. But what many people don't realize is that SpaceX's Raptor engines, especially the Raptor 2, are also dealing with their own issues. So today, let's break it all down and take a closer look at what SpaceX needs to fix before the next flight of its most ambitious rocket. Let's start by highlighting an often overlooked issue of the Raptor 2, the igniter system. While much of the attention has been on the dramatic explosions of Starship's upper stage during the last two launches, less notice has been given to the problems faced by the Super Heavy Booster's Raptor engines. These issues deserve scrutiny too. During the seventh flight, following stage separation, the Super Heavy Booster initiated its boost backburn to steer the rocket toward its designated landing zone. However, only 12 of the 13 Raptor engines successfully restarted. After the mission, SpaceX reported that the issue stemmed from a low power condition in the igniter system. Raptor is powered by subcooled liquid methane and subcooled liquid oxygen, operating on a full flow staged combustion cycle. This advanced twin shaft system uses both oxidizer rich and fuel rich preburners, allowing the full flow of propellants through the turbines without venting any unburnt fuel or oxidizer. An oxygen-rich turbine drives the oxygen turbo pump, while a fuel-rich turbine powers the methane turbo pump. Before entering the combustion chamber, both propellant streams are fully converted to gas. Ignition is initiated by torch igniters located in the pre-burners. These torch igniters, essentially miniature rocket engines fueled by the same methane and oxygen, ignite the pre-burners. Once the pre-burners are firing, they, in turn, ignite the high-pressure, mixed gases in the main combustion chamber. In the Raptor 1 design, a torch igniter was used in the main combustion chamber. However, with Raptor 2, SpaceX successfully eliminated the need for it. Exactly how they ignite the main chamber in the new design remains unknown. Elon Musk has yet to reveal that detail. In short, the full flow stage combustion cycle requires successful ignition at three critical points the fuel side pre burner, the oxidizer side pre burner, and the main combustion chamber. If anything goes wrong at any of these ignition points, the consequences can be severe, especially when dealing with liquid oxygen and methane, which are fully miscible and capable of forming a highly volatile mixture. Losing ignition in any of these locations is extremely dangerous. If it happens, the priority becomes immediate. Stop adding energy to the system and initiate shutdown procedures as fast as possible, regardless of the situation. Luckily, on Flight 7, that's what SpaceX was able to do. Afterward, SpaceX announced that future Raptor engines would feature a pre-planned igniter system upgrade to help mitigate this issue. However, on Flight 8, they encountered the same problem again except that not just one, but two engines failed to restart during boost backburn. So, perhaps this upgrade did not work, or they had not installed it yet on this flight. The good news is that most of these failed engines were successfully restarted during the landing burn. Now, let's shift focus to the Raptor engine issues in Starship's upper stage. But before we dive in, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It really helps support the channel and keeps us motivated to keep making high quality videos. Thanks. During both recent flights, Starship's upper stage Raptor engines experienced unexpectedly high harmonic resonant loads on the engine system's power elements, far greater than what ground tests had predicted. These abnormal oscillations caused structural stress and damage to fuel supply lines, resulting in methane leaks that ultimately ignited fires inside the engine compartment. The most likely explanation for this sudden appearance of harmonic resonance lies in structural changes made in the Starship Block 2 design, particularly involving its propellant feed lines. In Block 1, there was a single downcomer, but Block 2 introduced two additional downcomers, one for methane and one for liquid oxygen, routed from the header tanks. On top of that, the LOX downcomer now extends deeper into the LOX tank itself. The addition of these new lines reduced the overall rigidity of the structure, making it more susceptible to in-flight resonances that hadn't appeared during static tests. Unfortunately, the standard exhaust valves and nitrogen-based fire suppression systems were unable to handle the volume of leaked methane. 
the flow exceeded their capacity, making it impossible to vent or dilute the flammable gases quickly enough. Further complicating the issue, these feed lines are vacuum jacketed for thermal insulation, essentially a pipe within a pipe. While this helps reduce boil off, it also introduces fragility, especially at the vacuum to exterior interface. Supporting the inner pipe becomes more complex as well, since structural support can't rely on anything inside the vacuum space. When it comes to vibration, the more complex the system, the worse it is. It's worth noting that these feed lines aren't the only things that are overly complex. The current Raptor 2 is arguably also more intricate than it needs to be in certain areas. For instance, it still relies on hydraulic actuators to control engine gimbling, that is, adjusting the engine's direction. These actuators convert hydraulic energy, fluid pressure, into mechanical motion, whether linear, rotary, or oscillating. According to Elon, Raptor 2's hydraulic system is powered by onboard batteries, which drive electric motors connected to hydraulic pumps. These pumps draw fluid from a reservoir and supply it to the engine actuators, allowing the engines to pivot for thrust vector control. Sheesh, that's a lot going on. The reason SpaceX chose this relatively complex hydraulic system for Raptor 2 is because they had prior experience with it on the Merlin engine used in Falcon 9. However, in Merlin's case, the setup is much simpler and more efficient. Since Merlin uses RP-1 kerosene as fuel, it makes sense to use it as the working fluid for the hydraulic actuators. They simply tap high-pressure kerosene from the fuel pump to drive the actuators, then return the low-pressure fluid back into the fuel tank. It's essentially a closed-loop system with minimal losses. A straightforward and elegant solution when you're working with liquid kerosene. Well, technically, it is possible to use methane as a working fluid in hydraulic actuators, but it's a risky proposition. Methane has a strong tendency to gasify under pressure and temperature changes. If gas bubbles form in the hydraulic system, it becomes spongy and unresponsive, which can seriously compromise actuator performance. In a system that relies on precise control, that kind of instability just isn't acceptable. Fortunately, this complexity is only temporary. With Raptor 3, SpaceX plans to replace the hydraulic system with an electric servo, essentially a motor designed for precise control of position, speed and acceleration. It operates as a closed-loop system, using feedback from sensors like encoders to ensure accurate movement. Elon Musk described it basically a big electric screwdriver. This change not only simplifies the system, but also helps shave off some engine weight. And of course, there are issues with the vacuum version of Raptors as well. RVAC is a variant of the Raptor engine, featuring an extended, regeneratively cooled nozzle designed to achieve higher efficiency in the vacuum of space, with a target-specific impulse of around 380 seconds. However, despite its size and purpose, a vacuum-optimized engine is not as structurally robust as one might assume. The large, flared nozzles, optimized for performance in low-pressure environments, are inherently fragile. They're difficult to cool, structurally delicate, and particularly vulnerable to aerodynamic stresses during the transition from atmosphere to space. Even minor instabilities or vibrations during ascent can cause serious damage, as the thin-walled, expansive nozzle is far more delicate than the compact, rugged nozzles used in sea-level engines. Additionally, the regenerative cooling system itself introduces further complexity. The nozzle contains numerous thin channels through which liquid methane flows to absorb and carry away heat. If any of these channels are damaged, whether from debris, vibration, or external impact, it can severely compromise the nozzle's thermal protection. Over time, this may lead to localized overheating or even catastrophic failure. Fuel leaks, in particular, can disrupt the regenerative cooling system and further increase the risk of damage. During Flight 8, oscillations in the fuel lines caused them to rupture near the RVAC engines at the lower section of the Starship. A particularly dangerous moment occurred when the main liquid oxygen tank was nearly empty. When full, the liquid column helped dampen vibrations, but as the fuel burned off, 
the pipelines lost this damper, leading to a dramatic increase in vibration amplitude. As a result, several methane fuel lines depressurized simultaneously. High pressure methane surged into the intertank compartment, triggering a rapid fire. The blast wave from the fire likely ruptured the turbo pump of one of the vacuum raptors and caused damage to the adjacent central engine. The intense heat also compromised the nozzle's regenerative cooling system, which circulates fuel to absorb heat from the combustion chamber. Almost immediately, all engines lost thrust and shut down. With no active stabilization in place, the ship began an uncontrolled spin, which was captured on telemetry video. After several moments of rotation, the detonation system activated, and the starship was destroyed. Now, the most obvious solution to the Raptor 2's problems is to replace it with the Raptor 3. For Raptor 3, SpaceX has taken the core strengths of its predecessor and pushed them to the next level. One of the most notable improvements is a significant reduction in engine weight. To achieve this, engineers streamlined components throughout the design. As Elon Musk famously put it, bolts and flanges and seals, especially if they're hot, are prime targets for simplification. In response, SpaceX minimized these elements wherever possible. The engine's external heat shield has also been eliminated. Instead, Raptor 3 relies entirely on regenerative cooling and advanced high temperature materials to survive the extreme thermal environment. According to Elon, this change alone saves over 10 tons of mass. It also improves engine resilience as regenerative cooling is less prone to catastrophic failure. Alongside the weight savings, Raptor 3 delivers a significant boost in performance. It currently produces 280 tons of thrust with a target of 300 tons in the booster sea level configuration. Unlike Raptor 2, which traded a bit of efficiency for raw power, Raptor 3 maintains the high specific impulse of Raptor 1, 350 seconds, while dramatically increasing thrust output. Raptor 3 is indeed a great solution, but it is far from ready, and SpaceX has decided to stick with Raptor 2 for Flight 9. So for now, they'll need to reinforce shielding, take every possible precaution to minimize the risk of fire, and, realistically, hope for the best. In rocketry, the hardest part isn't succeeding a hundred times, it's succeeding the first time. Take the Falcon 9, for example. SpaceX failed to land its booster many times at the beginning. But once they figured it out and nailed that first landing, successful recoveries became the norm. The same will happen with Starship. Once they identify what's going wrong, fix it, and land it successfully, they'll be able to do it consistently from then on.